Hello and welcome everyone to this second session on Lord Alfred Tennyson's Ulysses. So my name is Diptoru Khos Dastidar and I am an assistant professor um, in the Amity School of Languages, Amity University, Chhattisgarh. And today we are going to have our second video lecture on Tennyson's Ulysses. Now we started out discussing about the background of the poet, the background of the age in which this poem was written and a little bit about what the poem is about in the earlier video. So um, do watch the earlier video before you watch this. And today we are going to talk about the poem itself. So we've talked about the age, we've talked about the poet and the relationship between the poet and the age. And today it's all about the poem. And the way I will discuss the poem is firstly, I will talk about um, you know, the background to the poem. So what are the sources from which the content of the poem has been taken and um, like why these sources? So that would be number one. Number two, I'll be talking about the form in which this poem is written. So what is the form of this poem? Number three, I'm going to talk about the verse structure of this poem. All right. So before that, uh, let me just clarify one thing about the last video that we had uh, in which I, um, I mentioned that the Victorian age in which this poem is written, it starts from 1838 and goes on up till 1901. And I gave you the reason why these two years. But I want you all to understand that when we classify ages, there is no strict rule of doing that. So these ages are based on some important dates but it's quite flexible and fluid so you might find that in some books you will have it in 1832 or in 1850 due to various reasons but uh, just know this that there is no fixed uh, there's no it's you cannot bind an age in watertight compartments so it's fluid it's completely fluid so that being said and moving on um, today we are going to talk about the poem and what is the background of the poem? Just like we discussed in the last video lecture itself, it is from the classical epics. That is the epics which were written uh, in Greek times, in Roman times. And um, Tennyson actually borrows from both of these. So Ulysses, in the last class we discussed that Ulysses is actually a Greek hero who has another name, Odysseus, because he loves to journey. He loves going out on Odysseus. And uh, well, if you play games, then uh, you would know that um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So that is a reference to this. And um, I mean, I think that playing games is a very important way, a very interesting way of learning new things. I use it all the time. So anyways, Ulysses. So who is Ulysses? Uh, Ulysses is a hero. Um, who is uh, Greek. Um, now why I say Greek is because in the epics that we have in the Greek epics, Greece is not the only place. You have other places like you have Sparta, you have Troy. So the Iliad is basically it surrounds a time, it is about a time which in the real world we call the Peloponnesian War. So the Peloponnesian War is a war which actually ended all of Greece and um, the Roman Empire begins after this. So I'll just write down the spelling so that it is easier for you. The Peloponnesian uh, War. So the Peloponnesian War. And in this war, I mean, it, 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 it took place over a long period of time. Um, you have um, all the, uh, you know, uh, different states, different countries battling together. However, our frame, our primary motive is not to discuss the Peloponnesian War, which is a historical um, thing, but to discuss the mythical um, origins. That is the epics, Iliad and Odyssey, both written by Homer. Now see, um, when I say epics, and these were primary epics, um, the nature of primary epics is spoken. 
So you speak, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, these were oral. So uh, these have been, these were stories which were passed on through generations. And finally, it was Homer who sat down and wrote all of it. But um, these stories have been there for a long time before Homer as well. So what do we have in Iliad and what do we have in Odyssey? Uh, let's understand it in this way, that in Iliad, I'll come to the name very soon because the name is very interesting. So in Iliad, it is the story of the siege of Troy. So you might have heard about this, the siege of Troy, um, in which Troy is a city and Troy is not a normal city. It is a city built by gods. More about it later. Uh, the king of Troy is a person named Priam, King Priam. And King Priam has two sons. One is Hector, the elder son, and the other is Paris, the younger son. Now, Hector and Paris, when they go to Greece, they meet Menelaus who is a Greek king and the wife of Menelaus is a beautiful lady by the name of Helen. So this Helen is the um, main character around whom the entire epic revolves, but there are a lot of digressions, a lot of gods come in. So you have all of that. So I'll not get into all of them, but still this is necessary to know that Paris and Helen, they fall in love with each other and Paris, and Helen, both of them, they elope, they elope, they go away from um, Greece and they come to Troy. Now, when they come to Troy, uh, this indirectly becomes an act of war because uh, the Greek princess has been taken away. The Greek queen has been taken away and now she is in Troy and the Greeks know about it. So the Greeks ally with the uh, Spartans and they come overseas to battle with the Trojans. So the people who live in Troy, they are known as Trojans, right? And um, you know about the Greeks and the Spartans. Spartans are from Sparta. Now, the two armies that we have, that is the Greek army and the Spartan army, they have their uh, commanders, you know, their heroes. And these heroes are Achilles or Sparta and Ulysses for Greece and both of them they take their orders from Agamemnon. So all these names are extremely important and so I have written all of them down here. These are the major names that you will find and um, uh, uh, they surround most of what happens and most of what happens in Iliad happens involving them. So let me clarify it down. Prince Paris falls in love with Helen. Helen falls in love with Paris. Both of them, they elope and this brings an act of war. Now, Greek army led by Ulysses and Spartan army led by Achilles, both of them led by Agamemnon, they come to attack Troy. Now, what is the problem? Why do you need so much, such a big army to attack one single city that is Troy, which has Hector and Paris, and it is questionable how good Paris is in battle. But Hector is one of the big um, heroes um, when it comes to uh, the epics. So Achilles, Ulysses, Hector, these are heroes. They are warriors. They are well-tuned warriors, well-trained and well-toned warriors. So why do you need so much, so many people? Why is it such a big fuss? Now comes the interesting part about the name. So I will just erase this part so that I can talk about the name of the story itself, that is Iliad. So the city in which they are coming to um, battle, this city is a city which cannot be destroyed because it was built by gods. It was built by Poseidon, who is the Greek god of seas, and Apollo, who is the sun god. So the Greek god of seas and the sun god, they both um, used music and they created this city. 
and they made sure that this city cannot be destroyed. So it is impossible to get into Troy. It is impossible to destroy Troy. And um, this name itself, why is uh, like the entire story, it is about a city called Troy, then why is the name Iliad? Why Iliad? It is simply because, and maybe I'll refer a little bit of Christopher Marlowe. Now, Christopher Marlowe is, um, um, he was a contemporary of William Shakespeare, and um, he had a tragic death in a tavern. And uh, one of the most famous plays by Christopher Marlowe is Dr. Faustus, in which Dr. Faustus sees the face of Helen, and he says that, was this the face that launched a thousand ships? and burned the topless towers of Ilium. So when he said this, topless towers of Ilium, see Ilium or Ilios, as it was called in Greece, is Troy. This city is Troy, none other than Troy. And therefore, the story of the siege of Troy is Iliad. In this battle, what happens is Achilles gets, um, you know, he gets hurt. Achilles has, uh, uh, you know, he's immortal mostly except for his heel and Paris finds it out somehow and he just strikes the heel. How exactly? I won't talk about that. But in the Battle of Troy, Achilles dies. Achilles um, is killed in the Battle of Troy. But Ulysses lives. He survives. And... Um, what Ulysses does is that he has to return back. So the war is done and now Ulysses has to return back to his kingdom. That is, okay, now I hope that all of this is clear. So I'll just erase it all so that now I can talk about our poem. This background I think was needed so that uh, you know about the epics because I think the epics are very interesting. So now I'll talk about... Um, Odyssey. So the Odyssey, and I'll just finish it off in two lines. Um, Odyssey is the journey back to Ithaca. So Ithaca is the land of Odysseus, that is Ulysses. And um, Ulysses' wife, that is Penelope, is waiting for Ulysses. Uh, she is waiting for Ulysses to come, and there are a lot of suitors who want to date Penelope, but uh, when Ulysses comes, he kills all of them. Um, uh, he uh, kills all his other suitors and um, all her other suitors and finally takes the throne. And now he is staying in Ithaca. This is the entire story of the two epics. Okay. But Tennyson does not take anything from this. He just takes the character, but he does not take anything from the story. The Ulysses whom we find in the poem is not this Ulysses, is not this Odysseus of the epics because the Odysseus of the epics is a young battle broiled Odysseus but the Ulysses that we find in the poem is an old person, an old and decrepit person like I said in the last video lecture and um, his reason for being so old is because Tennyson has not taken the idea of uh, Ulysses from Iliad or Odyssey, but he has taken the idea from another very interesting epic that is the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. So in the Divine Comedy, uh, there are three sections in the Divine Comedy. The first one is Inferno. The second one is Purgatorio. And the third one is Paradiso. Um, in which uh, Dante talks about the layers of hell. So the Divine Comedy is about, um, at least the first part, Inferno, is about the various layers that you find in hell. So the nine layers in which all the people, all the famous people 
दे आर ट्रैप्ड इन हेल एंड वाई आर दे ट्रैप्ड सो अमंग द नाइन लेयर्स इन द इनफर्नो इन द एथ लेयर you find an old ulysses a very old and ailing ulysses in this eighth and why is he uh, in the eighth circle because he is there for fraud and he is not alone people he is not alone in this he has another person that is diomedes diomedes is another fellow um, soldier of ulysses and why are they here for fraud because they were able to take achilles out of his home into the battle achilles didn't want to go to the battle and he died in the battle right so uh, they tricked achilles into coming into battle number 1 number 2 they made so how, i didn't talk to you about how exactly they won the battle of troy they made a horse now this is one of the most famous stories so i am assuming that many of you have seen this horse so they made a horse Uh, which is known as the trojan horse and the computer virus is also named on this so they made a horse and they got inside the wooden horse the trojan the trojans they looked at the horse and they saw that all the armies were gone there was just this one horse and um they started thinking that what exactly is this this should be the blessing of god and they took the horse inside the city then it was night the people opened the trap door of the horse and they were all inside the horse so they opened the trap door and they came out and they burned the city of troy and destroyed it so um that is how they won the battle of troy that is the greeks and the spartans and whose idea was it diomedes and ulysses so that is why because they um uh, they did what we would call fraud um that is why um well you see they are in the eighth circle of hell don't do fraud with people or you will burn in the eighth circle of hell that's what's going to happen but anyways um this is the ulysses from which tennyson takes his character so the Ten- the ulysses that we find in uh, tennyson's poem is actually this ulysses not homer's ulysses so i hope that the background of the story is pretty much clear um and i am guessing that at this moment i should take a break i will uh, i mean we have talked about the background and two things are left that is talking about number 1 um the verse structure uh, and the form so the form of the poem and the verse structure of the poem so i think that this would take up the next uh, video entirely and I was expecting I would finish off all of this in one video, but well, a little bit for later, a little bit for now. It's all good, isn't it? Um, so this was the background to um, the um, you know source behind uh, the poem that is Ulysses by Tennyson, and the reason Tennyson uses it, and there are so many reasons Tennyson uses it, but um, even in the other poem that we have, Lotus Eaters, that is again a myth that is taken from. odyssey so the second epic that is odyssey um tennyson connects the greek times with his present times and um he finds a kind of similarity between these two um we'll discuss more about these similarities as to you know the kind of feeling that ulysses has for achilles is very similar to what he has for his friend arthur henry hallam we cannot forget that in every poem he includes this he talks about this sadness that he has for his friend arthur henry hallam this poem was written in 1833 so arthur henry hallam died in 1833 so let it be said that this would be the end of the first video and um, i'm sorry the second video and in the next one we'll finish off with the background where we'll talk about number 1 the form and number 2 the verse structure of the poem thank you very much people see you again in the next video